Good evening. I'd like to call this uh, meeting to order. This is the City Council. It's our regular meeting. Today is Tuesday, May 21st, 2019. It's 6 o'clock, and our mayor is currently traveling, and so I will be running the meeting tonight. Can I have roll call, please? Of course. Council Member Kraus? Here. Council Member Lopez Ortega? Here. Council Member Williams? Present. Vice Mayor Dunsford? Present. And Mayor Canning? Absent. Absent. <laughs> Can you please stand and salute the flag with me, please? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. We had a closed session meeting on Wednesday, May 15th. Uh, there was no reportable action. The item was public employment, city manager. Uh, next item is oral communications. Uh, before we go to oral communications, I will be pulling item nine from the consent calendar and moving that to general government. So I know I received some speaker cards. Uh, you can hold your comments until we reach item number nine under general government. In oral communications uh, on consent items or non-agenda items, this time is set aside to receive comments from the public regarding matters on the consent calendar or matters of municipal concern not on the agenda. Pursuant to the government code section 54954.3, the Brown Act, however, the council cannot consider any issues or take action on any requests during this comment period. Speakers are encouraged to limit their comments to three minutes maximum so that all speakers have an opportunity to address the city council. So is there anybody that would like to address the council under oral communications? Yes, sir. And if you can, uh, please state your name and address, but you are not required to do so. Ah, thank you, Dennis McNay, 2653 Foothill. I like your idea of putting those generators in, Mike. I like the smell of diesel a lot better than rotting food over it at uh, your uh, establishment. But yeah, that being said, uh, uh, I suppose you guys knew when you built three new resorts that the existing lines weren't going to cut it, and these new lines would have to, these lines would have to be replaced with new ones. And uh, that's what they're doing. That's why with the generators. In fact, I just came by there. They solved the noise problem. They put 10-foot tall exhaust pipes on them. But I don't know if that's going to do the trick. Anyway, uh, I think uh, another issue here, I think that if we were to do away with buying the fairgrounds with collapsing buildings on it that are soon to be probably red tagged, might be money better spent if Calistoga was to buy the property, the Yellow Rose property, the 47 acres on Foothill, and buy that and put in a solar farm for the city of Calistoga. I think the people of Calistoga would appreciate that. And solar doesn't make diesel smoke. So that's my three minutes. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your comments. Anybody else? And if you want to speak about item number nine, if you could save it till general <coughs> government. Hi. Uh, most of you know me, I'm Paul Holm, 2551 Grant Street, and um, I'm here to speak about the Grant Street repaving and pathway project. First, I want to thank Chris and Gary for having the Mayor's Forum last week. We appreciate our opportunity to voice our concerns. For the rest of the Council, I, I'd just like to give you a perspective of what we heard, that it was a large turnout, overwhelmingly opposed to the project as it is now. And it was a very uh, strong uh, conversation um, for a couple of hours. I do have some substantive comments that I'll raise at a, at a future meeting. 
But for tonight, I just want to raise four very brief questions or points, which I understand they can't be answered right here, but to get them on the record. Uh, first of all, it was said in the meeting there would be more uh, opportunity for uh, public input into this project. I'd like to know when that's going to be and how people are going to be notified. Is it just the 13 people that are expected to pay for this, or is it a broader notification? Number two, when is the project going to bid? At the meeting, there was conflicting information. We were told June 1st, and we were told not June 1st. And number three, um, when will those of us that are expected to pay for this be getting a cost estimate? We've been told for a couple weeks we'd be getting this. I still have not received it. It was hard to go to the meeting and decide exactly what to say when we don't know how much we're being expected to pay. Um, it was a very awkward situation. And then number four, at the meeting, uh, the forum, excuse me, the, uh, something called the Complete Streets Act was talked about. And I'd like to know the city's plans for fully um, evaluating exemptions to that so that you could proceed with the paving of Grand Street and look at the pathways separately. So those are my four points, and I know they can't be taken up tonight, but thank you. Thanks, Paul. And Mike, will you respond to his questions? Uh, during the next public session, not while well, the next mayor's forum or whatever we want to call it, we'll okay. have answers for all of those. And right. uh, with regard to the estimates, we should have those out this week. Okay. As, has there been any uh, suggested date as yet for second forum? There has not. Okay. Anybody else like to speak during oral communications? All right, seeing nobody raising their hand, the next item is to adopt the meeting agenda. And again, I will be moving item nine from the consent to general government. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Next item, council requests and ideas for discussion. Uh, council member Williams. Yes, I'd like to report uh, that I attended the Napa County Watershed Symposium so I didn't know this before being on council, but the county uh, organizes a watershed information and conservation council, and it's uh, a variety of organizations within the county, and um, and the public is involved as well, and it uh, pays attention to uh, water issues, and of course that's a big topic here. So this uh, county sponsored the symposium uh, last week, and it was attended by a over 100 people, 150 or so people, and it was uh, all things water uh, related to Napa County. And uh, so there were, uh, and I went because uh, as a re representative of our council here, um, and so there were um, reports, it was a day-long symposium, there were reports uh, that I expected uh, that a report on the uh, Ex use of Measure A funds, uh, which are which are passed now, the flood control project. Uh, there was report about uh, the uh, condition of the river relative to uh, wildlife and fish. And Gary's familiar with this. Gary has served on that council for some time on this committee as well. Um, what was most interesting to me, besides those expected reports, those quantitative reports, were the uh, keynote speaker that the county brought in. A gentleman whom I don't uh, know, John DeGraff, he's a conservationist and a movie maker. But his main theme was the importance of uh, aesthetics and beauty in the, in the valley. So he got away from the uh, quantification and the science part, and he talked about, uh, I'm looking at my notes, talked about how the beauty um, of the valley, and of course the river is a part of that, is a unifying agent and helps build community and he emphasized uh, that economic growth uh, by itself is an insufficient indicator of happiness, but that aesthetics and beauty are uh, an important um, indicator of satisfaction in a community. And so not only did aesthetics uh, uh, start off the um, meeting, the symposium, but it was concluded um, by a short presentation by an artist who presented um, paintings uh, that also reinforced that theme of the importance of aesthetics and beauty in the valley related to water. So, um, 
So I just wanted to give you that report. It was, um, it was well attended and uh, apparently uh, pretty well received by uh, the participants. So thank you, uh, Kalsoka, for sending me to that. Thanks, Don. Uh, Iris? Uh, yes, um, in the same note, I, I had to report that I did attend the League of, of Cities North Bay um, Division meeting, where it was a discussion about S, um, S Bill uh, 50, uh, which is uh, about housing. Um, they were discussing about high density housing in, in all cities in, Cali in California. But that day, um, at the same day that we were meeting there, the um, the bill was both in Sacramento and did not pass. So so far, uh, we had no major changes in high density housing, but they still um, talking about it. And uh, this bill, it was really um, it will be uh, good for some large cities where they um, they can have high density because they they uh, had a lot of transportation and uh, but it will it won't work uh, well on cities small cities like us because we cannot handle high density housing so we will learn more about it. It was it was very good informative meeting. Thanks, Iris. Great. I don't have anything this evening. Okay. Uh, I don't have anything either. So the next item is uh, City Manager's report. Acting City Manager Kern, anything to report? Just a couple of things, um, Vice Mayor. Um, Monday is Memorial Day, so our city offices will be closed. Uh, police and fire will be open uh, for normal business. And this year we're going to do something a little bit different um, in memory of the veterans. Um, we're going to do a field of flags at Logby. We're going to put out about 50 flags behind the memorial. That'll be part of the celebration or the ceremony that uh, the um, American Legion will be putting on. So I'd encourage every, anybody to go out there and take a look at that. This will be the first year that we're doing that. Awesome. Do you have a time of the ceremony? Um, I don't. I tried to get that from Jim. I think he does one. I don't know if he does one at Pioneer Cemetery um, and then the one at Logby. No, I think he does think, about 10.30. I think 10 he 30. does the Pioneer I think it's at first. 9 and 11. Yeah. yeah. 9.30 and 11. Thank you. So we'll have the flags up Monday morning uh, in the field, and hopefully it'll turn out with good weather. Yeah. And then um, lastly, I just want to let folks know that next week we're going to start <coughs> construction on the parklet. Uh, that's in front of uh, the coffee shop here on Washington, um, Yoel Ray, and that'll be about two weeks worth of construction. We're going to completely remove the sidewalk basically from the, the driveway all the way down to um, Lincoln, and then about 12 feet of paving. So a couple weeks worth of work there, and then we'll get that parklet installed, and we'll see how it goes. Great. So there'll be a little bit of disruption. We've noticed the businesses in there in support of what we're going to be doing. Great. That's it. All right, thank you. Uh, next item is proclamations, presentations, and awards. And first, we'll have the presentation on Calistoga Library Operations. Hi. Welcome. Good evening, um, Council and City Manager. I'm Dennis Crymeyer, Director of Library Services and Community Outreach for Nava County. And um, I got some great news to bring forward. As you remember, we did that great remodel on the library. And part of the um, negotiations, um, because there wasn't enough money to pay for the remodels, they had to pay back the, the uh, library's fund balance. And before we could do that, before we could add more services, we need to have a little pot of money set aside. I am thrilled to be able to tell you that already in the, our fund balance, your savings account, for future needs, there's $540,000 saved. Wow. I know. I love resorts. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we do get our income from property tax, so that made a huge difference. Um, so what are we going to do with all that? Starting July 1, we're opening on Mondays. So you'll be open six days a week. We're um, also changing the hours so that you'll be open from 10 to 6 um, on the days that you are open during the day, and on Wednesday when you're open at night, 10 to 8 o'clock at night. So we're adding those hours. and. Um, I have told the staff there in Calistoga get ready to do some more exciting things uh, because there's certainly uh, money to pay for great ideas and they have some great ideas. And I just want to introduce two people to you. 
I want to have uh, introduce Jean DeLuca. She is your outgoing library commissioner who was there for the remodel and got us to where we needed to be and really worked on the financial plan to get that savings set aside. So she did a lot of the long haul. So I want to thank Jean. Hi, Jean. And I want to introduce your new library commissioner, Stephanie Allen. There. And she's got a lot of really exciting ideas and brings a lot of energy to the board. So I think you're going to be seeing a lot of exciting things happen at your library. So if you haven't been there lately, now's the time to go. Uh, check out your online resources. I don't know if you know, but for all of you who have Netflix accounts and Hulu accounts, if you have a library card, you can cancel your accounts because we have live streaming. You can stream movies. Uh, if you don't know how to do it, just come into the library. They'll show you, bring your iPad, bring your computer, your phone. They will walk you through that. Uh, all you need is a library card. Books on tape, movies, foreign films, uh, music. So um, you already have it. Don't pay twice for what you already got. So it's great stuff that we have there. Getting ready for Summer Reading Club. So it's going to be for all ages. We ask that you read 20 hours. That's going to be considered completed. And the really neat thing that we're going to be doing this year for all the adults who read 20 hours, we're going to be taking a um, board book and giving it to a newborn in Napa County. So you're going to read it forward. So all your reading goes to help somebody else get a head start on reading in their home. So I'm happy to answer any questions. And if I don't have the answer, I'll do the research to find out. So. Any questions? Um, my compliments to you and to the staff. And you have a nice, uh, the library is great here. It's a real asset for the town. Um, I forgot to mention today when I was there, one of the assets is the original wood floors you have there. And, um, yeah. and a coat of finish is appropriate. Uh, you have, <laughs> uh, so before it goes too far, um, I'm not involved, but, yeah. uh, but that's appropriate. So you can budget that in when you have a chance. I think we've got the money to do that, so Beautiful. we'll take care of that. Beautiful. I mean, that is one of my goals is to make sure that we take care of our facility and it doesn't get in the shape that it was before the remodel. Thanks for coming all the way up here for Thank us. You. Um, I just want to um, ask you, uh, will it be possible um, to reach out, out to the schools, you know, uh, with the technology that the kids have now, they don't usually go to the library like when I was growing is mm -hmm. where we used to do homework, uh, so it doesn't happen anymore. So. Maybe, uh, you know, um, do some kind of program with the schools that will be great so we, the kids, you know, learn about libraries because a lot of them, they don't know. Absolutely. We, we work uh, well with the schools. We'll be reaching out to them. We always do a big push about Summer Reading Club to get them out. We partner with the Sharpstein. We do our programs there. Uh, so yes, you don't necessarily need to come to the library because if you have a smartphone, you have a library in your hand. Right. So we want to show them how to use that to get the right information. Right. Yeah. Thank you. you but thank you for all you do. Oh, thank you. I was wondering how uh, usage has been of the library since the remodel. Have you noticed a change? You know, I don't have that on the, on the tip of my tongue, but I, it has increased. And in, um, I think more than usage is satisfaction and people really enjoying the space and spending time there as part of the community. It's a third space for people just to come and be together. So, um, and well, with the new hours, you should have new hours, yeah. Too. And we'll be out there promoting that and uh, getting the word out and doing new and exciting things. Great, thank you. So, thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> Next, we have a presentation on Boys and Girls Club upcoming programs. Hello, and welcome. Thank you. I'm Lainey Cronk, the unit director of our Boys and Girls Club here in Calistoga. And this is Christopher Duran. He's in, f in fifth grade and is a member of our Boys and Girls Club. Um, I just wanted to run you real quick through a few of the things we've super been, been super excited about at the club this year, some ongoing things. Um, we've had neighborhood nights. Um, we've had five times where we opened up the clubhouse on a Friday night to any family in the community. 
We've had 150, about 150 to 170 people come hang out, do games, tournaments. The kids teach their parents how to play foosball and if they've forgotten. Um, we've done art, we've done science. It's really, really a fun time. We do a full supper, full healthy supper each time we do a, a neighborhood night. Our clubhouse kitchen, so much healthy food stuff has been happening at the club this year and partly that's owed to a Calistoga Community Enrichment Grant, um, including lots of healthy kid snacks, uh, fresh, local, organic, and or unique ingredients. They had never seen a yellow flesh watermelon. They didn't know that they liked hummus, all kinds of things. It's been a fabulous adventure. Um, and we've also had our own staff as well as guest cooks who come in and work with the kids to use fresh, healthy ingredients, make delicious food, and then share it. We've just been loving the food stuff. Another thing that we owe partially to Calistoga Community Enrichment uh, money is STEM, our STEM lab, science, technology, engineering, and math, with a specific focus this year on some robotics um, and computer programming. We have, um, but we've had all kinds of stuff in there. We've done some kind of like introductory um, chemistry and physics projects for little kids. We've had an engineering club. We've had chemistry projects. And we've had um, legitimate pro computer programming. We have a computer programmer who works with us on, us on Thursdays and Fridays, a retired en aeronautics engineer who um, works with us also on Thursdays and Fridays. So the STEM lab is super busy. Um, and Christopher actually brought, if you want to hand me the big one. So come up close to the mic. Christopher, how often do you come to Boys and Girls Club? Every day. And what's a, a room that you love to be in? STEM lab. Yes, I know. <laughs> Tell me about one of the things you've done a lot of in STEM lab well, this year. Well, this year we're working on robotics. And in this one, it's Lego Mindstorm. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to bring a photo how would this look. It's half done. But I couldn't have time to bring a computer. So if you've seen the movie E.T., think about this E.T. This E.T., but with wheels. Very cool. And are you yeah. going to be doing some robotics at the club this summer? Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, Christopher. Mm -hmm. um, and then just finally, looking forward, um, we're super excited about summer camp. It's going to be nine jam-packed weeks. We have um, not only all kinds of programs and activities every day for just kind of the core camp, but we also have 15 specialty camps in everything from nature and biology to baking to printmaking, um, basketball. We have all kinds of things that the kids can sign up for. Um, as well as five major field trips and scores of a lot of these uh, specialty camps will be visiting places in the community. So they'll be visiting the bakery or a restaurant or different things as part of their camp. Thank you so much for your time. Do you have any questions for me or Christopher? Any questions for Boys and Girls Club? I just want to say thank you for all the work you do. You know, the kids are safe in your club and it's very important for them parents that are working. Thank you. You do an awesome job. Thank you so much for I, everything you do. I um, can't tell you how happy I am that the community really rallied around yes. getting this facility built Very and uh, the wonderful things it's uh, has the potential for doing and what wonderful things that you're doing right now. Thank you. Christopher, thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. yep, appreciate it. Thank you. Next item, we have a proclamation proclaiming May 19th through the 25th of 2019 as National Public Works Week. And I have a proclamation here to read. Whereas public works services provided in our communities are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, and whereas the support of an of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of the public work systems and programs such as water, sewers, streets and highways, public buildings and solid waste collection, and whereas the health, safety and comfort of the city depends on these facilities and services, and whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities 
as well as their planning, design, and construction are vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of the public works officials. And whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is material, materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Whereas the year of 2019 marks the 59th annual National Public Works Week sponsored by the American Public Works Association. Now therefore be it resolved that I, Michael Dunsford, Vice Mayor of the City of Calistoga, do hereby proclaim May 19th through the 25th of 2019 as Public Works Week in the City of Calistoga. Signed today. Derek, come on up. Come receive your proclamation here. Derek, your crew, your crew of Public Works does an awesome job. They always have a great attitude and they work really hard. Just want to thank you for everything they do. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much, uh, council members, and appreciate uh, the recognition and uh, the proclamation, and we'll uh, share this around the office. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks for coming. Okay, next item is our consent calendar. We have moved item nine from the consent down to general government. Uh, that leaves items four through eight. And I know that council member Krause is gonna be abstaining uh, from items five and six. It's, that's uh, right. due to the fact that I live close to the subdivision and precluded from and uh, me too, I had to recuse myself from those two uh, items uh, as well because I rent a property in the subdivision. I, I'm not sure that two people can vote on it. Uh, they cannot. So we would have to move these items to the next uh, meeting. Yep. We'll and just wait. carry it over. Okay, so we'll carry those items over. That leaves items uh, four, seven, and eight. Is there any discussion or is there a motion to approve? Move to approve, move to approve those items. Is there a second? second? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. There's no public hearing tonight. So we're gonna move on to item number nine. Item number nine is a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute grant deeds to PG&E for installation and operation of a pre-installed interconnect hubs for anticipated public safety power shutoffs. The recommended action is to con uh, consider and adopt the resolution. Um, good evening, Vice Mayor, uh, Council Members, my current acting city manager. The item before you this evening is to consider the adopting of a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute grant deeds uh, to PG&E for the purposes of installing infrastructure to prepare the community for anticipated public power safety shutoffs, uh, PSPS. Um, staff has been working closely with PG&E for the last couple of months to try and do some forward planning uh, so that similar situations that happened last fall don't happen this fall. Um, in our coordinations with PG&E, they've identified two sites that they would, they've identified as being um, workable for the installation of this um, pre-planned um, interconnection hub, which basically is putting all of the infrastructure in place so that all they have to do is bring in generators and they plug them in and it powers up um, portions of the community. Um, one of the things that they're working on is trying to identify how many generators are going to need and how big of an area in the community they'll ultimately be able to um, power up. One of the concerns that they have in this whole process is making sure that whatever they do is safe for not only Calistoga, but also for the surrounding areas, uh, particularly on the west side in the high severe fire hazard areas. So we don't want to 
solve one problem and create another um, in doing that. The two locations that they've identified um, in order of preference, the first one would be at the lower um, Washington next to the Little League field, what I'll call the, the, the dog park. Um, that's desirable for lots of reasons from their perspective. The biggest one is that it's about as remote away from the community as we can get. So we're, we're, they're trying to move all of those impacts associated with noise and sound, noise and um, diesel fumes or fumes um, as far away as they can. The second location is the triangular uh, lot that the city owns um, at the intersection of Lincoln Avenue and Silverado Trail. That would be a contingent location in the event that there are any issues that preclude the dog park um, property from being fully uh, completed. We've, um, in working with PG&E, we've um, identified a self-imposed goal where we have all of the work done um, on or before September 15th um, with the understanding that there's a little bit of a cushion before the actual PSPS events are anticipated to occur. Um, last year, the first one that they noticed they would be pulling the trigger on was I want to say October 7th. So we're, we're trying to build in a couple of weeks of contingency there. And the reason that they need easements is because there's a fairly significant um, expense that they're getting ready to embark upon and they want to make sure that they have the right location and the right authorizations before they start doing the, the engineering and the planning to make that happen. Um, there are representatives from PG&E here in the audience and so I think at this point um, I'd like to ask them to come forward and, and answer any questions that you may have, but, but that's really it in a nutshell for me. Um, this is one of the other things that we asked them about was why can't the generators on Highway 29 continue to be used for this fall on PSPS? And we were told that because of the work that they're currently doing and their schedule, um, those generators are most likely not going to be here and in service uh, come October 1st. So they need, we need to plan for something else uh, as a substitute. And so I'll, I'll use my words, they're, they're not going to be available this fall uh, to do what we would like them to do. Um, and the efforts that we're putting forward right now are to substitute those to the greatest degree possible. Okay, um, so let's hear from PG&E or if we have specific questions. How you doing? Hi, I thought I'd take a moment to introduce myself, uh, Vice thank Mayor uh, Dunsford. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Manager uh, Kern, used to saying Public Works Director. Um, and uh, Council Members, <clears throat> I, uh, my name is Mark Van Gorder. You are probably familiar getting emails from me about incoming storms that are usually wet. Um, or outages or, or, or other things that PG is doing. Um, and uh, so tonight I'm here to introduce uh, John Stallman who uh, works on, on these uh, pre-installed interconnection hubs. I'm simply uh, taking a moment to reintroduce myself. I don't get up to Calistoga uh, as often as I might. Tonight we're talking about the pre-installed interconnection hub. <clears throat> it's, it's related to a couple of things if I can touch briefly on, um, uh, I want to say manager current, uh, talked about the generators. Um, they may be there into some of the uh, higher fire season time um, up, up through September. Uh, but the reason, and we've talked with, with Mayor Canning about this, that the main reason that we cannot use those is because the lines run through uh, California Public Utilities Commission designated high fire threat areas they call them tier two and tier three. Um, that, that's why we're here to talk about the options that we have uh, to perform that. The other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, at the council's discretion, if you'd like, I'm happy to come back at some time in the future and make a deeper presentation on our, our community wildfire safety program. Talk about public safety power shutoffs, enhanced vegetation management, some more inspection programs for our transmission towers and distribution poles if that's of interest to you too. But for now, I'll turn it over to John. Thank you. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm with PG&E, my name is John Stallman. Um, I'm in a group called Grid Integration and Innovation, largely focused on microgrids um, throughout the state of California. 
And Calistoga is in a unique um, situation, as Mark explained, with the, the transmission lines that come into this area running through the high fire threat district. So we recognize that during a public safety power shutoff, a large vast portions of the valley floor, which are not in that high fire threat district, are impacted. So we have been piloting a new solution throughout our, our area. And um, the, the plan that you see on the, on the screen here with this, the land that was described for you um, fits a lot of technical dynamics. And I'll just spare you of a lot of the technical until you want to ask more questions. And I can, I can answer those questions as you need. So maybe I will let you ask the questions that you need information on that goes beyond what um, Mr. Kern has, has provided. I have a number of questions. Uh, I understand that this facility will power up the city basically to the east of the river, not to the west of the river. Uh, the reason being uh, a danger of uh, lines coming down on that side of the river and a fire spreading from there. Basically, this facility will power the entire community, city limits, let's say, um, with the exception of what is west of the what is west west of the river, um, and that would be right up to uh, the highway, Highway 29. I'm guessing yep. all of the <clears throat> the homes that are along uh, Highway 29 that are on the west side of Highway 29 would be uh, powered up. And uh, that would include the fairgrounds would be would receive power. We can talk about what receives power and what doesn't. Yeah, I, in I more think detail. I think that's going to be important as the discussion goes on here. Uh, the fairgrounds will receive power, and I think that's important because if there is a fire-related evacuation, that's the evacuation center for a significant area usually folks coming from Lake County down this way. Um, the school would receive power. So the school would not have to be shut down uh, for two or three days if uh, it's during the work week that the power gets shut off. Um, downtown gets powered. The part of downtown that is east of the river. Um, there are a couple of areas that I am concerned about that are west of the river. One of them is uh, Rancho de Calistoga, mm -hmm. which is a major mobile home park uh, for seniors. And right next to it uh, is the Riverly subdivision. And um, uh, is there, both of those are <coughs> west of the river. Uh, are those ex exceptions to the rule west of the river or uh, are they not going to receive power from this project? It's a very good question. So we have certain areas that we're going to be able to address in a very short term given the existing configuration of what the distribution grid looks like in this area. Um, the west side of the river has a particular distribution line that goes into the high fire threat district. And because it goes into that high fire threat area, that we consider um, something that would be de-energized during a public safety power shutoff. That line is what supplies to um, the mobile home park and the adjacent community. So in the short term, that park is not included in the energization. In the longer term, we can um, evaluate what it takes to, to support that area um, and reroute our distribution line to support that. Um, that's going to take time. Anytime we reroute a distribution line or a transmission line, we have to um, navigate easements, install infrastructure. All of that takes planning um, and engagement on that. So, so we, we could be looking out in time at that and we will be doing that work um, in the short term it is not included um, and there are a number of vendors available that we're happy to 
um, work with that property owner to enable those properties um, during a public safety power shutoff. So as, as interest allows, um, uh, we can help direct to those types of vendors that can support those, those areas. So when you, can you clarify, so when you say west of the river, are you talking about uh, everything <clears throat> on the far side, on the other side of the river from, say, the city limits all the way up to uh, the gas station and uh, R Riverly? Correct. Yep. The entire line along the road on that western side, mm -hmm. um, that line is insufficient to operate during extreme conditions only. So, so one thing I do want to um, clarify. Uh, public safety power shutoff has a period of time that we would call extreme weather condition. That extreme weather condition is dependent on the weather, right? It, those high winds could last six hours, they could last 12 hours. In that duration of time, uh, the circuits that are in the high fire threat district will be turned off. Once the high winds have, have subsided and those winds are no longer there and we start to restore the system, we will have areas that take priority to being restored. And those are areas that can um, extend out of this pre-installed interconnection hub. So our intent would be to restore lines like that as quickly as possible while we clear or, or verify that there's no damage to our system outside of that area until we can restore the entire area, which is um, can be, not necessarily that it will be, but can be up to three to five days. One of the scary things I heard on television <clears throat> last night, I believe, is that the public safety power shutdown could affect San Francisco. <laughs> yes. So, any chance you're going to take our generators away and put them over in San Francisco, or uh, are these going to be committed to us? So. That's a supply chain management. Once we put the generators in place to support this area, they will stay here until the event is finished. We won't pick them up and move them away to another area. I do want to clarify with the San Francisco article that that is a very extreme case. On the, on the bookends of extreme, that is on the very extreme case. So I, I think um, we just need to keep that in scope where Calistoga sits in an area where it's very frequent that the winds are here um, and the type of lines that run through that high fire threat district are ones that would be de-energized more often based off from the weather that is here um, and the area, the geographic area. The likelihood of San Francisco being de-energized is very low. It's an extreme case. It was an um, interesting story. It is an interesting. <laughs> it, it draws the it draws your attention to how the system works, and what happens during certain levels of de-energization. You know, some of our some of our transmission lines are big, and they're on tall towers, and they they're far less risk to those than um, the smaller lines. I think of it like a a tree. You've got a trunk of a tree that's big and stout. And then you've got branches to the tree that extend out, and those get smaller and smaller. And then out at the end of the branches, you've got leaves dangling off from there. And that's, that's all of our, our different customers, including myself. And so the trunk of the tree is really strong. Um, the branches are, are more fragile, and we need to take caution with the branches. So the likelihood the trunk is going to be a problem is very low, but we still need to keep that in our work as, as distribution and transmission operators. We need to keep that in our work to make sure we understand what those impacts could be on the extreme cases. Okay, so as what I'm getting from what you just said, right now because of the way the lines run, the area west of the river uh, is not going to receive power from this new facility. However, when the high winds abate and when you're able to do a priority inspection of the line along Foothill, you will be able to energize that before other areas are 
energized and that would be powered also out of this that is what we're trying to size the system okay to. and sometime in the future um, the line alignment will be such perhaps that uh, those facilities or those areas won't have to be shut down at all Yep, and and I want to caveat that there's okay. a there's a lot of assessment that has to take place to I'm, make I'm, sure that that I, works. I right? understand that yeah. you guys have, uh, you know, we are 2.25 square miles, something like that, in a state that's 750 miles long. So uh, you don't cover the whole state, but uh, it's still a big area. Yeah. So um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I was aware of that. And the number of generators that you are uh, looking to put in there is sufficient to uh, power up the city without having to say, you guys can't run your air conditioners or... Uh, right. So I just want to draw your attention to the footprint here. This footprint is a footprint that um, is adequate for up to 6.5 megawatts, which is what our assessment has been in the area here. And we're working to um, define more, more clarity to that as we, as we start to get into engineering of this. We're defining that area and we'll know exactly who and, and what boundaries will be energized. Um, the, the footprint itself has a limitation to the amount of generation we can put there. I, I do also want to draw your attention that the three boxes on that screen in that area is called a pre-installed interconnection hub. It's agnostic to what we plug into it. So we could plug into that lots of different ways to generate electricity. The electricity that we generate needs to be able to handle 24 hours a day. So solar can only be one piece of it because that's only when the sun is shining. If we have solar and we have battery storage, then that's a, a really large area that exceeds the area available here. So we have to find a source of generation that's going to fit in a reasonable space that we can also mobilize to that location. So there's a couple of different ways that we're looking at there and we're trying to source ultra low emission natural gas with CNG, compressed natural gas. We're working in that direction for the immediate design. It's diesel generation. And we hopefully will be able to move to other types of generation to help support in this area. And that's our overall goal throughout the program, not just in Calistoga, is to move to cleaner and cleaner resources. But the technical limitations of those resources are that it needs to be able to generate for 24 hours a day for three to five days in duration, which means three to five days is longer than a battery can support. That's longer than solar can support. So when I, I'm a solar battery storage guy, that's what I like to do. Um, and if we could do that in this location, we would do that. But it's simply not technically feasible to do that for three to five days. The generators aren't going to be stored there during this portion of the year that we're not at risk. Is that correct? You're going to remove them and perhaps correct. use them elsewhere. Correct. The, the intent that we've discussed with this site is it would be a co-usage as a dog park when the generators are not there. When the generators are there, the dog park would be closed off to usage and to try to frame how often that is. Of course, it's weather driven. So mm -hmm. I'll just throw that out there that we can't control the weather. That's going to come as it will. Um, we're predicting that there could be, on the extreme end, 10 of these events. On the other end, it could be one event. But you should count on at least one event, because given this area, the weather across these mountains once a year is probably going to cause this to happen. In what time frame? Um, it's, it's usually when the east and northeast winds, the offshore breezes are blowing, and it's really dry air that's drying out and bringing the moisture content really low, and the winds are very high. So that's generally speaking um, uh, anywhere from September 
to November. That time frame is very typical around here. But we also are trying to prepare people that it could start at the start of the wildfire season, which just started on Monday of this week, and could go until deep into November or December before the first rains come around. So we all need to be prepared, including myself, living in a very rural area at the south end of Paradise. So I'm very acutely aware of the wildfire conditions and uh, also very aware of the weather conditions. So I just think everybody needs to be aware of that time window and the frequency that we might experience these. We are prepping people that it might occur up to 10 times during a year. So an average uh, length of time would be three months, which is typical September through November where things start to dry and the winds are picking up and we may not have rainfall until December. So that would be a, a normal year. Yep. Uh, but if we're in a drought type situation or prolonged extended drought, then uh, the, the, the fire season uh, can be m much extended on the, on the front side. So it could be uh, May through November. Correct. Cal Fire is prepping us that the fire season in California, it, California is moving to year round. Mm -hmm. So we just all need to be aware as the public that the fire season is extending to a 12 month cycle. Um, we happen to be lucky this year. We're getting rains in May. We might get rains in November and that would help close off the season and put boundaries around it. But we should be prepared for 12 months a year. The yeah. winds really are only coming during a particular time frame, yeah. depending on where you are geographically in California. And the transition from your power sources, is that seamless? It is not. We will be doing what's called a break before make, which means that we're going to turn all the power off and then isolate the area. And hopefully we'll be able to do that all automatically and isolate the area. We're moving to that technology. This is all new stuff for us. So we're doing some manual isolation, some automatic isolation. Um, this area will be an automatic isolation. Um, we have to get to that point when we can operate that from our distribution control centers. Um, that's our goal. Um, so there will be a time period when uh, up to a couple of hours where people are without power and then we will re-energize as quickly as possible through the generation at this site. So let me walk through that a little bit more carefully with you. Um, we have something that we start prepping five days in advance of the weather. As the weather develops and we gain greater confidence that the weather is going to be there, at three days out from the weather event actually arriving, then we start to dispatch mobile generation to sites just like these. As it's dis dispatched at three days out, it gets all set up, ready to go. Two days out, we start to get more confidence in the weather system. One day out, we have pretty high degree confidence of when it's going to happen and everyone's notified. And, and I don't have all the notification sequence down. It's, it's, Mark may be able to speak more to that. Um, but the idea is we will mobilize these, this generator about three days in advance of it, of it needing to support an area. And then at the moment when we get the notification that says, okay, your power is going out, then we're going to go and turn the grid off. We're going to isolate the area that's going to be energized, turn these generators on, and then they will function during the, the course of time that, that the extreme weather event and all of what we call restoration is occurring where um, our crews have to go and visually inspect the lines um, that, that have be, been de-energized and make sure that we don't have any trees that have fallen on them or, or any kind of issues with any of the distribution or transmission system. When we're, when we're confident that that has occurred, then we can go ahead and restore grid power and these, these generators are turned off. At the, at the point that the weather event is, is done, then we will take the generators away, we'll open up the fence, and, and the idea is that it could be restored as, as in this co-usage environment, it would be um, set up for the dog park. So when you're approaching uh, 
uh, a wind event, you have a high degree of confidence that it's, it's a real event, and you have to de-energize <clears throat> the main po power system, um, is there a specific time of day that you're going to do that um, for any sort of safety reasons? Like if you did it, say, at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, that might have the least impact on the community versus, say, 7 o'clock or 4 o'clock. Do you know that answer? Well, I, have, I can. I, I, yeah, yeah, please. <clears throat> I don't know that well, answer. Well, so. I'm going to, you see if you agree with me. Um, <laughs> What I would su suggest is that we'll take every safe precautionary measure that we can and take into account that doing it between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. or 2 and 4 would be least impactful, less people on the road, all those sort of things. If the weather event is coming in and, and the predicted highest speed winds that we're seeing with the National Weather Service, with our Safety Operations Center, Cal OES, We'll be talking with the county OES, with Carrie Whitney and Kevin Tui, and I, I can go into a longer discussion if you're interested about notifications. But what I would suggest is that when the wind shows up, we're going to get active to, to energize and, and start the isolations. And so if we're seeing the winds showing up at 10 a.m. or noon, we're going to start that work as quickly as we can. It might be 8 a.m. I guess that... So it could happen anytime. This is the bottom line. It could happen any time, mm -hmm. and, I, and I have a bit of reservation. Um, I have a bit of a reservation to say that we would do it at night without alignment with fire, police, um, emergency response to ensure that we aren't creating an additional problem by doing it at night. I, I think there's a bit... I'm going to ask these questions, and I appreciate that question. I can take it back to our public safety power shutoff team ask these questions about what what has been thought about with the time of day. I think they're probably going to give a similar response to what Mark said is in terms of the weather is the weather and when that critical moment shows up we want to make sure we're in advance of that critical moment by enough time. Um, and that analysis is going to be very dynamic based off from the weather that arrives. It could be a fast arriving weather system where we have to move quicker. Um, it could be something very predictable. We have seen weather events that show up very, very quickly. And we've seen weather events that we could see far out and have a really high predictability of it. We've also seen weather events where we show up, we mobilize, everything's there, and at the last minute it really doesn't show up. And so we demobilize. One of the unusual things about this area, because the hills around here uh, and the way a front would move through is sometimes you don't really know when that wind that's up at 3,000, 4,000 feet is going to surface. Yep. And uh, you can have virtually a still day and have a red flag kind of a situation and everybody goes, gee whiz, it's not windy at all. But then, you know, 10 minutes later... Uh, the wind can really start whipping. So I appreciate uh, that. I can I can appreciate the uh, caveats you're putting in here about what well, we think and maybe and like that. And I'm assuming that you are going to always err on the side of caution. So absolutely, absolutely. We have a pretty sophisticated uh, weather modeling team that has ramped up to address this very specific thing on a on a on a localized level. So I thank you for those comments. I appreciate that. And I always try to, when I'm going into areas like this and we're looking for these kinds of solutions, we try to identify what these local dynamics are from the folks that live there. And, so. and I don't know, Dano, do you know how close the nearest Raws is to us here? Part of um, PG&E's wildfire safety plan as well is we're deploying weather stations throughout the territory to be able to measure localized winds um, at our asset level. And I believe there is one that's been installed. Um, I can't identify the road, but I think I saw it the other day when I was over here looking at your system. So, I don't okay. know. I know they're, they're putting a lot of cameras out. Yeah. 
and and like that too. Uh, so Don Iris, do you have a uh, questions? Sure. Yep. Iris. Um, thank you for coming, and I I um, appreciate your concern for your, the safety of all of us. Um, so a number of questions surfaced uh, from uh, the public, um, and so I'm just going to run through these here. Sure. And um, one there's. Uh, interest in the existing generators there on Lake County Highway. So, um, and those are, you know, very uh, obnoxious. You know, the noise is terrible, but you know about that. And what's the, what's the, uh, what's going to happen to them? Are they going to stay? Is that, is that um, system going to be removed or is it going to be uh, left as, a, as an option? What's the, what do you expect will happen there? Marty here can speak more to that. Um, I can just summarize by saying they will be removed when the project work is done. Um, there's extensive project work being done on the system. And as soon as that work is completed, they will be removed. Marty, do you want to say any more? I mean, that's, that's accurate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so those are basically a temporary, that's basically a temporary situation yes, there. Sir, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, might might just support the question there was, you know, uh, there's been questions around why we can't use the generation that's there right. during a public safety power shutoff event. Right. And I just want to be clear that that substation and its position, the lines that feed it are going to be de-energized because they're in the high fire threat district. Those are the transmission lines. The lines that go out of the substation are also in the high fire threat district. So those we will not be operating either. And that's the reason we're seeking a different location for this temporary setup. And so as for the different locations, one of them is down the Triangle area uh, at the Silverado Trail, and that is for backup to the backup? Yeah, let me help with that, that question. Yeah. So what we wanted to make sure we, we did, we created a contingency plan. So we know that um, through lots of my other work around the state, we run into a time period where we have to establish a location. We have to record that easement to be able to access the location. Then we have to build the infrastructure. That scope of work and the timing to it is dependent on a lot of different variables, right? One is, is the willing land partner. One is the technical things that need to be done. So. In light of that, because we're just getting started with this, our scope and timing is, is we set a goal and we're working towards that goal. But if we don't arrive to that goal for one reason or another, then we want to have a different site, which we can use strictly as a temporary site for this 2019 year. So that should a PSPS be called, let's say, five days from now, we would be able to completely um, use that site as a temporary location, stand up the generation we need to support the same boundaries that we've been discussing so far. The boundaries don't change because we're trying to stay within the, the what's called tier one um, and outside of the high fire threat district. So that's important to recognize that the boundaries remain relatively similar but the site is used in a very temporary way. When we're all done with the event, we clear off the site, and then the site is no longer, um, it looks just as it does today. Um, and, and so. So is, would that also be true of the dog park situation? If, if you go in and, and put the generators there, and then when they're not being, not necessary to use them, would the dog park look just as it looks now um, after the, Temporary generators are moved. Am I understanding that right? Yeah. So the image on the screen is just a concept drawing, just to help represent where some things might go and how much space would be available for the dog park. Our intent there, let's conceptually speak here, and we can align with what the needs are of the community. Um, we're prepared to put um, uh, decomposed granite over the area, which seems like a lot of dog parks have that kind of a surface. Um, so we're prepared to prep the surface that would be suitable for us in terms of being able to park heavy equipment there. And then also when the heavy equipment is gone, then what's remaining is decomposed gravi gravel 
or decomposed granite, which then can be used for your co-usage in, in the dog park. So, so after the potential of danger is passed, mm -hmm. um, we, expect, we would expect that the dog park would be restored to its present condition. Yeah. Uh, yes, that is correct. So just to confirm what, what you're describing, yes, the dog park would be restored to its everyday usage. Um, I will say, though, that during a certain part of the year, and we generally recognize in, these, in this geographic area, it's the fall, and it's October, September, October, maybe November. Um, if we have repeated events, you will have a greater frequency of the generators be here, to be here if we find a need to maybe leave them there, not in operation, completely quiet, um, then we may need to leave them there. Otherwise, we would be taking them out and bringing them in and taking them out and bringing them in. So there may be a time period of the year where we leave them there a little bit longer, but the, the goal and intent would be bring them there, set them up, use them, take them away, dog park is back to usable again. Is this an ideal location for what you're contemplating? Uh, for example, the city has property a little bit farther down the, the road there. Um, is any of that uh, land, which is even a little bit farther away mm -hmm. from residences, is any of that land suitable for the applications that you're contemplating? So we looked into that. Um, we worked with city staff to, to try to identify the ideal location. Um, I was provided a, a map of all the city properties. We, we took and analyzed each one of those uh, that seemed like good locations. And then we did an environmental survey on those locations to determine whether we could use them or not. And, and this narrowed down to the best candidate that was the farthest away, that was within reason to distribution infrastructure, distribution lines, we're going to still have to bring additional, we're going to invest in more resources to bring the distribution line to this location um, that can handle the 6.5 megawatts. That, that takes infrastructure work. We're going to make that investment. Um, if there were another location, that we could identify, we we're open to that. Um, we've done the the look. We've worked with city staff. This seems like the most viable. So, if it was, I'm, I'm bringing up topics that have been brought up to me. Sure. If it were moved 300 feet down the down the pathway there, um, does that entail a great deal more infrastructure work? Is it is it actually infeasible, or almost anything's possible? Does it become just 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 uh, prohibitively expensive? Um, I would say that anything is possible. However, there are land constraints that exist as you move further down. The land gets narrower. Yes, yes. You have, you have one side which is used as a gray water distribution area, um, and then the, the land parcel narrows as you go down the trail. Right. Um, and we don't want to infringe on the trail. So... So if they go in, if the generators go in, um, you're conscious, I'm sure, by now of the, um, of the um, quality of life uh, question, that is the noise mm -hmm. and the expulsion of fumes, uh, odors, and so on. Mm -hmm. So do you anticipate that you'd be able to take measures to try to arrest those um, problems, uh, mitigate them? Is that something that's in the plan as well? Yeah. So, so just to just to be frank, diesel is not the ideal answer from the emission standpoint. Um, we have our goals are to move to a cleaner and cleaner resource to make this work. Um, there are certain locations where solar and battery storage do make sense. If we can work to that goal in the long run, we'd like to. Six point five megawatts is a lot of energy. That's a, that's a big demand. And typical solar battery storage doesn't support 6.5 megawatts, um, and especially in this land area. So diesel is a tried and true reliable resource. Um, it's used in a lot of areas for this very purpose, emergency purposes. Um, we are investigating um, 
really rapidly and diligently the use of natural gas, which is cleaner. Um, and in fact, have identified vendor resources that are ultra low emission natural gas and quiet. Um, and we want to pilot that at this location. I'll be very, very frank though, let's be clear about it. That solution is not ready to operate in the field. We are in development of that solution. We're not ready for that. If it were to happen tomorrow, diesel would be what we would roll to this location. Um, there is options of sound barriers. Um, it should be noted too, usually during a public safety power shutoff event, as I've visited with fire experts and walked through many territories, in fact, this one, as we were identifying where we could energize, um, the winds will blow out of the north, northeast in this area, so blowing away from town. Okay, so, so town center that is. And I realize there's populated areas all the way around, um, but siting it at this location is preferred over other locations where that could be a f more of an issue. And so the sound mitigation, that's something that, that you would incorporate into the temporary uh, uh, what are there baffles or what measures can be taken? Yeah, so there is a sound boundary that can be put up. Mm -hmm. um, we've also answered a request to get um, concentric rings of noise to know what the noise will be out in distance so that we understand um, how the impacted area will, will be. Um, I think it's worth recognizing that um, the choice to move to a cleaner and quieter resource is something that we would prefer, as, as you would as well. Um, so we'll continue working in that direction. In the meantime, um, sound baffling is what would go around these units if and only if this concentric rings of sound, as you move away from the generator, the sound gets less and less. So if we could determine that the sound was minimal at a certain distance and this location satisfied that, we may not need the sound boundary around it. And, and I do also want to remind everyone that this is being operated between three and five days. During that three and five days, there's going to be fairly significantly high winds. The extreme wind period is when we turn the grid off but that doesn't mean that the wind stops at the end of the eighth hour of it blowing. It means that it tapers down slowly but surely over the next couple of days, typically. So does the letter um, that you sent to the city, is, does that, pro does that uh, propose um, that the city um, give this land to, um, to PG&E or is it a lease that the letter is talking about? Or uh, who, does the city retain ownership uh, how, how does that uh, contemplate it? So in this situation, in most situations when we build infrastructure like this, we do what's called an exclusive easement. And in that exclusive easement, there would be a fence around it. There would be no public access. We would use the equipment. Essentially, it's still city property. In this situation, it's a co-use. We're going to use it during the extreme weather conditions. Um, the rest of the time, it's the dog park. I think we need to navigate that with our, with our land team and your city staff to, to determine um, uh, all the right dynamics there. I'm not necessarily a real estate and land um, professional, so we'll engage the professionals for those details. And then do you anticipate um, that the backup system that you're contemplating would be sufficient for uh, to power the town as much as you hope um, for as long as as um, an event would last that's the goal that's the goal yeah and that's why we choose the generation resources that we need is because of the unknown of how long it's going to last so the three to five days is a broad estimate um, and the generation that we choose will, will be in operation during that time. Of course, during the daytime, if there's air conditioning loads, there will be more generation used during the evening time when there, it's cooler, presumably, uh, and there's less demand, then, then there won't be as much operation of the units. But they will be refueled on site. These will be sequential, 
In other words, if you don't need them all running, correct. just the ones that are needed to run will do so. Correct. When we do our assessment, it's based off from peak demand, your biggest demand, so that we make sure we cover your biggest demand. Um, however, we know that that is not the peak demand doesn't occur throughout the day. It usually only occurs a couple of times or once a day. And, and will there be um, costs to the Calisoga consumers as a result? Will, will there be a surcharge assigned to Calisoga as a result of this work, or PG&E is doing this as part of a bigger, a bigger picture? Nope, no cost. It's a solution that we want to support and energize. It's our responsibility to energize the grid, and this is our solution to energize the grid during a public safety power shutoff safely. Great, thank you for those answers. And I have another question then um, of us council members and Michael, how, how does this affect our, uh, our movement towards our own microgrid system? Would this be complementary to that? Um, would it render the, our microgrid backup um, redundant? Uh, how does it? You know, how does this fit in with that micro microgrid uh, concept that we're studying at the moment? I think so, this is it. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll try and answer that. I mean, this is a this is a piece of that. Um, whatever microgrid we ultimately end up landing on, I think the studies that will be undertaken are what is the generation. You know, how are we going to generate enough power to power up the community? Um, so that's the, the generation component. Right now, PG&E has identified you know, 6.5 megawatts through generate generators to serve the community. As John indicated, it may not ultimately be generators that provide that. It could be solar. It could be geothermal. It could be, you know, hydrogen fuel cells, it, you know, the technology, I think, is as far as we want to dream. But for my comfort level, I want something that the city can rely on and that's going to, you know, meet the tried and true, you know, test of this works. Um, this isn't the time to be experimenting on, you know, what what technologies might be out there. We, we basically have a very short window of time to get ready for this fall. And that's part of the reason why I brought this to your council now, because there is some heavy lifting and a lot of planning that needs to happen, you know, over the next three months. Um, and right. PG&E is getting ready to make a pretty significant investment on reconductoring or putting in new, new power lines to this, to this location. Um, having, you know, a location where the generate, where the, um, transformers are provides you know a very easy place for us to to tear off of uh, whatever those generation sources are um, you know one of one of the concepts that that the study is going to be looking at is where are those critical facilities and and how are they powered well if if this facility you know takes care of all, a majority of the city sands the west side of the river then we've accomplished a significant, you know, goal, and and I think in relatively short fashion, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that PG&E's generators are going to be there year-round. Um, and if we wanted to go there, then that would be an investment that we might have to look at doing. So, if we green light this proposal, um, PG&E would have access to that area for the foreseeable future until a better alternative that becomes available. Correct. Um, so may I comment on two, two aspects? Um, I understand your, your microgrid evaluation that's taking place. Mm -hmm. um, w we've done a lot of work in that area as well to try to facilitate those kinds of things. So when you're ready, let's, let's talk more about that. Um, we view it as um, the utility's role is to configure the grid to enable you with the um, types of developments that you want to do. So in this scenario, you, you have significant um, regulatory uh, things to navigate when you talk about having your own microgrid, and I, this is not the place for that discussion. Um, so the way we think of this pre-installed interconnection hub and the effort of 
energizing the valley floor is that we're getting the grid in a configuration I call it isolation points so we're cutting the grid off at certain locations so that you can have this pocket in the valley floor that you keep energized we're getting that configured in a way that could be leveraged for other purposes down the road um, so I think of it as like a phase one phase two phase three what do we do in phase one let's get the grid configured in the right way and then you as Calistoga can figure out how you want to do phase two, phase three of your development process. I see those efforts and I've done the math to it um, for several years now. It may take you a significant amount of time. It may take you five to ten years before you reach those types of goals. Um, in that scenario, this type of a facility can, can be leveraged for that purpose. It could be leveraged into a phase two and phase three and we just need to be creative about how that gets leveraged. And does this, facil and does this facility benefit as well uh, customers for PG&E who are outside of the city limits of Calistoga? Does it um, extend beyond that? So this gets into what I like to call the technical feasibility. And that is, it's not just bound by the city limits. You can kind of spatially think of it as the city limits, but really there's portions of the county that will be in within this energized area and there's portions within the city limits that are not going to be in the energized area so it's not a clean line at the at the city boundaries it's going to be a mix um, and as we move down this journey of developing and, and engineering this facility then we'll have better clarity of who will be notified when this is going to be turned on and those people that we know it will be turned off what we call service points or customers those customers will be notified that that they will be without energy and the customers that will have energy will also be notified so that so that they can be aware john thank you very much i'll be interested in uh, questions that uh, iris may have or the public sure. um, just a couple comments um the uh, quality of life of our residents is very important for this council so um, my main concern will be that um, for those areas that will be no covered with this project, uh, do you have any plans and emergency plans how to provide assistance to those areas, especially the areas where the, uh, you know, a, a lot of our elders live, which is the Rancho de Calistoga and, mm -hmm. and that area. Um, so you had any emergency plans or you know you think about that and also um if this um is gonna cause any pollution any noise any you know if you are gonna take care of those problems so you know our residents will be no uh, affect so much I appreciate your questions let me see if I can answer I think I heard two questions there mm -hmm. one question is about um, uh, uh, fragile populations right. and um, the local area needs um, I take particular attention when I try to locate areas to include things like emergency facilities the the fairgrounds um, the boys and girls club um, the schools fire stations police stations um, things that create community normalcy and are shared by everybody in the community those things are really important to us and so when we energize a portion of the grid the fragile populations are also very important to us i want you to note that but reaching all of the fragile populations is very difficult so there are programs that pg e is has developed to to help out with customers um, but I, I want to be very clear that we won't be sending a generator to individual locations we will only be energizing um, the portion of the grid that the utility has the ability to manage those service points that are outside of the energized area or the places that get power um, we need to work with everybody to make sure they're prepared so that may be community resources granting agencies that 
we're happy to work with you to identify um, areas of special need and help um, provide you that resource to, to contract and procure um, energy uh, for those areas and, and special programs. But we need partnership with your community. We don't want to do it as a utility alone. We need to engage with Health and Human Services. We need to engage with your fire departments, um, your, your um, public and private engagement agencies to make sure that those populations are cared for in the right way. So that's your first question. Your second question is about emissions. Mm -hmm. um, so again, um, our, our go-to in a short term is diesel generators. Um, we're going to do what we can to contain what everybody in this community has recognized as um, a short-term disturbance by the emissions of those generators. We recognize that's not the ideal solution. We want to move to a cleaner resource, which is ultra-clean natural gas. That has not ever been done before. Mobile gas generators is not something that we do on a regular basis. So we need to create those things. And so we're in the process of designing and engineering and contracting with vendors that can bring us um, generators that run off from cleaner burning natural gas. In the longer, longer run, hopefully we can get to even more renewable type resources. But renewables are difficult because they're intermittent. Solar only operates during the day. Batteries only last so long. In order to make that combination work, it, it actually hasn't been proven that well. When you get down to um, more than one building, it's been proven well for one building. It hasn't been proven well for m more than one building. So when, the, when, when we try to clean things up, it gets more difficult. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, Mr. Stallman, thank you for, uh, for that. I'm going to um, open this to the public because I'm sure they have some questions. So if uh, you can stand by. Um, I'll first call up uh, Richard uh, Ushik. <laughs> uh, Richard Juszczyk, uh, 1709 Renard Lane. Um, I guess uh, what I heard is the same thing I've been hearing uh, uh, in all of our uh, next door and things like that. Uh, PG&E has an idea, but they don't have a plan. I'd like to see for the next meeting a plan that shows us more detail than a couple of squares. I'd like to see where the towers are going to go that they need for their infrastructure. I'd like to see the grid that they claim they're going to put in. Does it go from Dunawheel to Tubbs? Does it go from Silverado? You know, all we hear is, uh, um, all we hear is, we're going to do this. It's in the planning stages. I think they need to come up with a plan, okay? The, um, the other thing is, is this going to benefit, and I think you skirted the issue, uh, is this going to benefit other people? Is this thing going to supply Middletown, uh, St. Helena, Knights Valley, Mark West? What is the, uh, what's the potential of these generators? Is, can somebody come up and say, well, look, at, we're right down the street. Can you run a line for us? We have to put up with the noise. They get the benefits. Uh, as far as the rent lease for the, uh, um, the manager, or the, sorry, the city manager, uh, I think we need to be, have some transparency in it. Is there a go going to be a lease? Is there going to be a rent? Is there going to be something that the city gets back for putting up with all of this, uh, this noise? Um, I, my feeling is, is once they're in, they're not going to go away. I can't see these big trucks going back and forth and moving these things, concrete slabs maybe, infrastructure, wires, um, just moving out of the area. Uh, as far as location, uh, I like what Mr. Williams said, is maybe moving it down towards the uh, uh, reclaim center a little bit better than, or putting it into the public work yard and uh, you know, leaving the 
ball field without any fumes, leaving the uh, uh, leaving the uh, sorry the uh, manufactured uh, home park uh, a little bit further down for the wind, so the diesel uh, exhaust doesn't carry into it. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Uh, next, I have Paul Home. I think he's left. Paul's left. Okay. Uh, Brian Fennin. Sore sitting there. Um, uh, Brian Fennin, a resident of Calistoga and president of the Calistoga Community Garden on South Washington Street. I'm going to go ahead and read this so I stick to cover all my topics here. First of all, I'd like to express our appreciation of the city's support for our new garden area. It's up and running. Plots are still being built and, and planted, um, but it's looking better every week. Gardening is a serene pastime for some. Um, it's a family activity for others, and our gardeners represent a cross-section of the Calistoga community. Um, I'm here to express our concerns regarding the proposed PG&E project to install heavy equipment on the lot adjacent to the community garden. I've spent many hours in South Washington, both as coach for our Little League, more recently as a primary volunteer building the garden. Uh, having spent considerable hours there, I find it's probably the most peaceful and quiet area within Calistoga city limits. The garden and Little League have worked with the city to implement a beautification program in South Washington that's gradually taking place. Um, unfortunately, it seems the beautification and serenity of the area is about to come to an abrupt end with this proposal. We are concerned about the introduction of a mini power plant in a quiet part of town, as well as what impact its construction and presence will have on our garden. Fall is harvest season. Fall is fire season. Imagine the taste of diesel fumes on your veggies. We have just heard about this proposal, last night in fact, have not had an opportunity to review, review or comment on specifics, many of which are lacking. Um, take a look at the satellite image, which is different than the one that's posted on your website, but I'll take a look at the one that I, I'm commenting on first. They use a 2016 photo before the restrooms or garden were installed. Um, there are two recent and much better images from Google Earth that clearly show the new restroom and garden. I'm familiar with the general dimensions of the area as I negotiated and laid out the location of the new restrooms and the garden and wondered about the proposed area, the PG&E equipment. The PG&E documents ask for permanent easement through 120 by 130 foot area. The rectangle on the proposal is 100 by 115. Even that smaller rectangle encroaches into the garden. Where are the remaining 4,000 square feet coming from? Other concerns include the proposed route to, uh, route to distribution goes directly through our hookups for water and electricity and through our future shed. Where are they connecting to? How much disruption will there be to our garden, including limited access, intermittent power, and water shutoffs? Are they proposing to store diesel fuel um, in a floodplain? What is the potential environmental impact? How much material is being excavated from the site and where is it going? Um, they've already addressed an issue, a question about why not on Highway 29. So we feel that the propose, proposal represents a huge step backwards for the South Washington entry into our town off the New Vine Trail, which is going to be completed in a few years. And it's being rushed through without due process. Um, we ask that other locations be considered, ask the construction details be provided by PG&E, and then proper public review take place before further consideration. Um, the comment on this, so this is different than the one is posted on um, the documents. So the documents, like I said, it's 100 by 115. This one extended down, I'm just going to point this out if you don't mind. So this area here is the vine trail where the bikes go through this gate. So this can't be used. The restroom is right here. The garden is actually this right about this line. That's fine. This is already encroaching. So I would have a question for you about um, if you don't mind the question about how fixed are you on the size of that and your layout. Now your other layout is this older or earlier, or older or later than 
so yeah, I appreciate right. the acknowledgement there. Uh, oh, hold on. I'd rather you speak uh, in the mic, so if you, if yeah. you give a chance to, because oh. we, we have an audience at home oh, okay. uh, watching TV. Okay, so. great. I, I appreciate your ob observance of the, of the drawing. That's really just for concept to understand the location. And um, we're not fixed or bound to those specific boundaries. So we definitely want to respect your garden area and correct the boundary to that. Um, and I do recognize that in this image, the bathroom is not there. I think this was taken off from Google Maps um, and Google Earth, at least my Google Earth has the bathrooms there. So I, I appreciate your recognition of that. and. It certainly recognize that those bathrooms are there and we would work around those bathrooms. So again, I just want to reiterate that these boundaries are not fixed. This is not, um, this is purely made for us to be able to have this conversation. And so I appreciate that. And as an avid gardener myself, I really respect your, your um, concerns about the so area. So the 120 by 130, it, part, part of the reason I ask is because when your legal documents, if this is going to be the area of choice, when the legal documents are drawn up, um, I, I would think you'd want to be very careful about the uh, definition of the perimeters. And also, even I'd be concerned about the permanent easement. That means in perpetuity. So I don't know if you could change that language to be a fixed period of time, 10 years, 20 years, something that the city would eventually get it back because you won't be able to then use it for if there's a, a local grid going on. Um, those are my comments. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Scott Atkinson. Vice Mayor Dunsford and members of the council, I'm Scott Atkinson, 2103 Oat Hill Court, Calistoga. Um, I had submitted a letter and I think it was pretty clear on my opinion on it or my position on it. Just a couple of points of clarification. The dog park and the generators cannot, under any circumstances, exist in the same area. Um, I'm not sure how many dog parks Carlton Lear from PG&E has designed, but I'm pretty sure it's one less than I have. Um, the dog park is not DG. It's a combination of cross fencing. It's a combination of a calming area fencing. Uh, our goal was to have a shade structure in the dead center of it, water hookups for dog water bowls. Uh, part of it would be sawed. Um, it's just, there's just no way possible that the two could exist. So if you go forward with this, then we need to start over on the dog park. And if we do that, we will have lost the improvements that the city has already put in in the form of a restroom, an ADA parking spot, parking availability, access to other recreation needs. All those dollars are pretty much going to have to be replicated elsewhere if, you, if we have to move the dog park. Um, the citizens really need, to, and, and this is, you know, obviously my position is for the dog park, but the citizens of the community really need to see a map of who's going to be included in the energized zone and who is not. I think that's going to, it's, it's something that the community has to buy into, and I don't think that there's very much clarity there. Um, as Richard said, we need to refine what is actually going to transpire from a financial point of view. Is the city going to get any money for this lease? unless you can show that it is an extremely high percentage of the community that is going to benefit of it, and I realize that there is a public good element, um, but otherwise it's a gift to public property. I will say that I'm generally in support of the work of PG and their employees that they do, but let's face it, they do not have a stellar track record of communicating what they are doing or doing what they are not, or not communicating what they are doing. There was a, a, a comment that everything would be removed, but that's not true. If you look at the staff report, some of the equipment will remain. And as I pointed out in my letter, our dog park area is already about the third of what we had previously. And even from that one, we had complaints that it was a little bit too small. The final point I want to leave you with is uh, the gentleman's presentation. 
And these are some of the words that I kept hearing over and over, hopefully, eventually, as quickly as possible, based on available resources, and that's the goal. I think we have a lot of answers that still have to be answered or, or questions that have to be answered. And so I just ask that you move forward a little bit slower and get a little more public input on it. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the speaker cards. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? Come on up and get, introduce yourself. Uh, Dennis McNay, 2653 Foothill. I'm on the west side of the river. Anyway, uh, I have a few questions. What really makes me kind of leery about this whole thing is I'm leery about PG&E bearing gifts to Calistoga. You know, why didn't they just don't let the wires fall down and just ignore us? Why are they bringing these generators to us all of a sudden for we're going to use them three to five days <clears throat> of course you know this are the, the area or, or the time we're talking about september is the prime for cala or calistoga well whole napa valley because that's harvest season and that's our busiest time yeah we don't want to be without power that's for sure but uh Another thing, with that being said, uh, what about an earthquake in July? How long does it take to get these generators here and running? You said three days when you were planning for it. But how about if you weren't planning for it? It's going to take a week, a month, or they're somewhere else being used by somebody else. In fact, how modern are these generators? Are they old generators? Are there turbine generators that you only need one of to generate that much power? Are they available? Or are they somewhere else? Do you have an answer? Well, let's, uh, Mr. McNay, just, if you're done with your questions, we'll certainly give I'm them the opportunity. I'm not quite done. Let's, let's just keep in mind that these specifically are to address the dangers of wildfires. That's, that's why we're... Well, we're shutting off the power, which we had before, and we, we suffered through that. I'm just pointing out they're not doing this to, for the event of an earthquake, it's specifically for wildfires. Well, I'm just wondering how long it really takes to get these here, if we need them, needed them, and something like that occurred. Uh, you know, like was said earlier, I would like to see a grid map as who's going to be supplied, which new resorts are going to be supplied, and which ones aren't. And he mentioned early on that there's vendors to take care of people up in the Riverly area and Rancho de Calistoga. Now, I'm wondering what, quote, a vendor is. Is that somebody that brings in a generator and sells it to you? Or is, uh, are we going to get help with that? You know, I realize there's a lot going on with PG&E after they got slapped on the wrist by a judge, all of a sudden these gifts start coming to us. Well, how, you know, is the judge going to say, well, you have to take care of these people too? I'd like to know that. And, and he talked earlier about a tree trunk and the branches. Well, I think the money's located at the tree trunk also. Hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, anybody else? Hello, my name is Elizabeth and I live on Oat Hill Court and so I've experienced the generators and um, I just want to be the voice for the backup property that's located at Silverado Trail and Lincoln. That property, if it were to be granted to PG&E as a backup location, is 100 feet from the nearest home and so if these generators were to go off 10 times a year, even two times a year, the people who live nearest that property wouldn't be able to live. So the voice for not granting the easement on that location and finding a different location. Thanks. Thank you.
Good evening. Um, I have a real problem. Are you guys under the Brown Act? Well, we're in public session, but we do follow Brown Act guidelines. Okay. My understanding is you can't require somebody to state their name, and especially not their address. You aren't, you're not required. Okay, you've never made that clear the whole time I've been here. I stated it in the beginning <coughs> of the meeting. I have confirmation. Okay, it's to prevent <laughs> um, retribution if I say something that isn't liked by somebody in the audience or yourselves by knowing who I am and exactly where I live. So with that being gotten out of the way, um, I have some questions. As far as Little League goes, I am vice president. I work very well with Brian. <clears throat> and I have known Scotty for years. I do love dogs. But I also know that Tedeschi is an extremely beautiful grass lawn that everybody loves to have their dogs run on. We have problems with it. We've locked our gates to try to keep the dogs off of it. When we play up at Logby, we are often in contention with dogs. We've had players attacked by dogs out there as they're trying to field the balls. So it's something we have to deal with. Um, I think the, the dog park is good down there. So we have to work together to get this whole thing working well to start off with, okay? Some of the questions I have for PG&E on it, um, I would like to also see the tier maps of exactly what areas they're talking about when they mention tier one, tier two, tier three. To them, it's common knowledge what they're talking about. It's their own language. To everybody else, it doesn't make any sense to me. I'd like to point out that the only service stations to get fuel in an emergency are all located on that side of the town. I'm not one that usually runs out of fuel, but I don't have friends. I have friends that don't always keep their tank full. And I have to say, before the tubs fire, I was very grateful. I had a full tank that day because I needed it. Um, what is the decibel level of these generators? There's been a lot of contention about the races being in town and violating the decibel levels. What is their decibel level? I'm a race fan. I want to know what the noise factor is. I've gotten grief for being a race fan and liking the races. What is the, the balance there? Um, I am concerned about a grant deed. That sounds very permanent. Everybody else seems to deal well with a lease. I think a five-year limit is what it is. Um, last. If this does go in down there, I think the city should seriously consider mowing the water field because it is a fire hazard. During the Tubbs fire, there was a fire down there in the river about 1 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it was put out very quickly by our fire chief and the water tender, but it's, it's not unforeseen that a fire could happen down there. And as far as pg and &E goes, I'm having um, questions because... They just replaced most of these lines after the tubs fire, the transmission lines. Maybe they need to um, bring them up to a higher standard if they're aware of the winds. And fire does happen under red flag, which doesn't include winds. It's the humidity and temperature. It's not just winds. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from the public? Good evening, uh, Aaron Harkin, uh, 1019 Myrtle Street. As a uh, member of the community on the other side of the river, uh, is it possible to get some uh, uh, insights as to what, if any, solutions are on the immediate horizon for uh, servicing that corridor uh, beyond just what they have for uh, the main substation servicing the majority of the town? Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Okay. Um, acting City Manager Kern, are there, based on these comments, is there anything specific you would like to address? Or I can also ask uh, Mr. Stoller to address any questions or items that maybe have come up. I'll try and answer a few questions. Okay. So what pg e is requesting and what we're recommending is that they be um, we, we begin the process of developing language that would provide them a, a grant of easement. 
um, so it would be an easement under current recommendation and their request it doesn't necessarily mean that that would be the final uh, document um, they're looking for some certainty and longevity that when they make this investment that this facility will be able to be used uh, for an extended period of time it's it's kind of un I mean I think we're all in a new normal uh, when it comes to this and I I don't think anybody has a magic wand as to how long PSPS might be with us um, given the court decisions and all of the pressures that the utility companies are under I think it's a forever thing um, the ability to underground uh, the conductors or the overhead lines on the west side of the river are going to be challenging um, for it's my understanding that the cost to underground those facilities and and what that would do is help to take them out of the tier two area it wouldn't ameliorate it completely uh, but undergrounding overhead utilities is somewhere in the range of a million dollars a mile so if we're looking at going you know basically from the southerly city limits to the northerly city limits it's upwards of two and a half to three million dollars to do that um, so it's and it's not something that happens overnight the the easement would would be just that it would be an easement um, we had not anticipated collecting any rent or anything like that um, given the, the nominal use of the property that they're requesting we understand you know that there are other needs in the community but what we're what I'm trying to do is put forward a, a plan of action that provides the best ability for the city to become self-sufficient and self-reliant to the largest degree possible during these events um, as John indicated it could be one it could be ten um, I I feel the the pain um, when the power goes out in more ways than one um, it's it's very challenging to run the city at least the critical infrastructure on our backup generators um, we have generators at the fire station police station public works and then both of our utility uh, facilities and during the fire we were able to maintain all of those utilities but it was challenging to get fuel in and out on a, on a recurring basis um, having a single location where that power generation takes place is, is very attractive and desirable from my perspective both as your acting city manager but also as your public works director um, I'm not going to get into the specifics on you know how their facilities are going to be operated uh, that's for them to go into um, with regard to the Little League field I'll say 95% of the time that these generators would be operated are when Little League is not in session um, I did reach out to their president um, they are winding up their season and barring any weather delays for their tournament of champions uh, they expect to be finished with their season uh, the first week in June so although it, that is a, a nice area to recreate short of having somebody you know trespass onto their property or their their fields there shouldn't be anybody out there um, in September through November um, I guess at the end of the day I'm we're trying to achieve the greatest good for the most people with the least impact to the community and this location was identified as the preferred alternative for for multiple reasons um, the distance away from um, Chateau Springs and the mobile home park is just under a thousand feet um, and as John indicated the, the wind blows from or as council member Krauss indicated the wind blows from the north and east to the south so it's pushing that sound away from from that area we we have asked pg e to put together a sound contour map that would identify how far those those noise uh, decibels are I would expect by the time you got to the mobile home park that the desk the noise decibel would be well below um, our threshold of action under our general plan um, I, I think that's about all I want to add right now and ask John to come forward I, I, I have a question the way this looks is it's a rectangle 
and I see a pile of I'm sure very useful junk uh, which would be to the east of that is it possible that we could simply move the rectangle to uh, rotate it to the right on that on that photo and uh, not have the impact uh, on the uh, the garden being quite as much uh, or any impact on the garden and then uh, I, I don't see a way around um, uh, the dog park I, I if, if this location is used I I agree with Scott that the dog park is more than just a deco decomposed granite area for the dogs to run around on I mean there's a lot of other stuff and and Scott's been very good about uh, moving it at least once uh, so that we could build the Boys and Girls Club. So um, it, would it be possible to simply rotate that and mitigate some of the uh, the problems? So I'll leave that up to PG&E, but I, I think anything is possible. Um, the biggest, so the, the, the colored squares that you see on that, on that um, rendering, those are the, the permanent above ground uh, facilities. So it's two switch gears and three transformers. Um, could those be relocated a little bit further south and outside of the dog park? Probably. Um, the underground ground grid is, is probably the thing that's the most critical. That's subsurface and you won't, you won't even know it's there. We, we have uh, conversed with pg &E as to whether or not um, grass could be grown over that. And for at least two reasons, they said it's not desirable. One is the weight of the generators moving in and out require you know some fairly sound or substantial uh, subgrade. And then secondly, um, irrigating over a ground um, is not a good thing. Um, that it's the water becomes a conductor and and makes it less safe and that's I'm not an electrical engineer and I'll leave that up to these guys to, to answer and so, then uh, one of the questions that came up was is this going to power up Middletown and Hidden Valley and St. Helena and and like that um, I'm uh, guessing at 6.5 megawatts that's pretty much right around here yeah I, I can answer that one it will not be sized to serve any areas outside of I'll call it Calistoga proper uh, mr. Stoller could you um, talk a little bit about vendors and just uh, there was a question about what types of resources are out there other vendors that provide sure and, and vendors is really a generic term um, describing a variety of companies whether it's going down to Home Depot and buying a generator that's a name brand Yamaha is a it you know Home Depot would be a vendor of a device okay to to a specific vendor that specializes in backup generation right which we've aggregated a list of these vendors that have the capability to do it safely and um, we can we can help um, connect people who are interested with those resources um, and help facilitate those resources. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Just following up on mm -hmm. Gary's, yes. So to the right of the, of the uh, proposed area, there's a variety of vehicles and, and um, I don't know. junk, that's what I called it. Yeah. So. Yeah, so that's, that's a good. There. That's so a good question. The boneyard cannot cannot that, you know, the dog park has to be a unit, but um, but all those vehicles and so on, can those be redistributed, you know, farther down down the uh, trail, and so that the uh, so the PG and E has the area right next to the dog park instead. So I think Vice Mayor called it what it is it's our boneyard um, we do need a place to operate we need a place to store our equipment our parts mm -hmm. um, we have recently invested in 
a beautification project, putting a fence around that so it doesn't look so junky. Um, moving that stuff further down would, I th it's not going to completely um, impinge upon our operations, but it's not going to be attractive. Um, we are site constrained in, in our operations. Um, we can we can work towards um, moving some of those things out of that area, but in you know respect for PG&E, the further we get away from their distribution system, the more overhead lines need, will need to be constructed. So it's it's a it's a balance of aesthetics versus functionality. Sounds like it's doable. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. Well, that would that would keep the dog park. And gentlemen from PG and E with that um, you know, I'm looking at what the bone yard now. It look, at least on the photograph here it's a smaller uh, area. But you know, looking at it is it conceivable? Is it something that, that could work? Yeah, I'm, we're trying to be responsive to the community and the and there's and the um, dog park. You know, is a yeah. part of the picture as well as the garden. Well understood. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, What's it's conceivable, but I do want to honor that that is really a um, city decision. Yeah, it has a use now. Right. Um, and and so I leave that to the, your discretion. Um, conceivably, yes, there. It is possible. It it may be possible to not completely move it to that area, but move it partially over to that area to allow the dog park to have the covered shelter that was described and various other features that would be permanent infrastructure on their part. Um, and so maybe there's a way to meet in the middle somewhere in there. But I really leave that to your discretion. There's. There's two about equivalent size parcels there, but um, as noted, we we had discussions about uh, the purpose of this location, and so I'll leave that to your discretion. What, uh, refresh my memory. The three green squares are transformers. Correct. Correct. Permanently installed, and they don't have to go there. By the way, that's, I just oh, okay. I that's, just that's, want to that's know. What I'm want you to, to know that's, that they can. Be that's moved. what I'm getting to. Yeah. The uh, red square is what? As uh, switch gear, um, and it doesn't have to go there either. It's where our distribution grid would come into. Okay. Um, that again could move down to where the current. Uh, I believe the trailer inside of that boundary is um, the uh, is fire related storage, um, and. Uh, I think we talked about that can move to a different location so there's some area there and then the blue square is the well, yeah the blue square is what we call a recloser and that's protective equipment electrical protection equipment okay <clears throat> all all um, essentially five of those squares are um, slightly larger than this podium um, maybe two times this podium for each unit. Um, the purple and the red one are smaller in size. Um, you see them commonly outside of um, uh, various um, buildings, commercial buildings and such. The small but green boxes. Basically, you're pretty flexible on where those squares go within the within the footprint. Yep. Okay. I, I just I really want to reiterate that this was a conceptual discussion That's, yeah. graphic yeah. Um, and we're willing to mm -hmm. massage the boundaries of it as well as the location of the infrastructure within reason we still do need to be able to place some large pieces of equipment there on a temporary basis and so we need to be able to situate those large pieces of equipment which means we have to have a certain access to that and to be able to place them so this would, um, if the council takes affirmative action here this evening, uh, would this footprint come back to us or go through the planning department and the, the uh, public works department as far as massaging it a little bit to uh, 
to mitigate as much as possible those problems that you've heard here tonight? I, I, I think we, we need to begin those conversations. We need to work with your process. We need to um, try to try to work in these solutions for each user. Um, and, and then we need to take a look at it from the real technical standpoint of what makes sense and try to mesh all those together. Um, okay. If we are successful at doing that, then we, we have a cohesive match. If we're not successful in doing that, then, um, then we may need to find a different location. Uh, I just also wanted to point out to the council that we could consider an alternate location for the dog park. So, are there are there? I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, like right. fairgrounds could be a possibility. We are in negotiations to acquire a portion of the fairgrounds. We don't know the final results of that. Even if we don't, there might be a way to uh, negotiate something with the county. Um, it was there before. It's close. It's got public restrooms. Um, it could be potentially a better site than being next to the courtyard. So, I mean, I think we can solve both. It's just going to take a little time, a little flexibility, work with uh, PG&E and come up with the best solution. I, I think from my perspective, what, what we were trying to accomplish when PG&E approached us was, it, for me, a sense of urgency um, because we don't have a, a long window of time um, and so, you know, a one-year solution might be something that we're going to end up looking at um, for this PSPS. Um, the other thing for me is that I was looking for underutilized um, properties that, you know, haven't really mature, haven't reached their full potential. And it's it's been a little... I'm grateful that the community garden folks have, you know, stepped up and implemented what they wanted to do. But I really haven't seen the, that movement from the dog park people. So it was an asset that was being underutilized and seemed like a, a good solution for what we're trying to accomplish right here. I wonder if Mr. Solomon would like to address a couple of the uh, concerns that were raised uh, by the public. I made notes of just a couple. Um, there was um, interest in uh, more detail regarding the grid and the towers. Is that is that feasible? Is, is that a a good question, or is it is the conceptual um, enough? I think it's a very good question. Um, I want to I want to honor um, that we are trying to find an expeditious way of addressing this year's goal as well as a long term um, solution. Um, I want to make sure that we provide enough information for your community and your um, leadership in your community to be able to communicate to um, your population of, uh, that's, that's going to get served. I want to, I want to make sure that we honor your, um, your local ability to convey those messages. Um, we, we can eventually, when we get to the specific design, um, be able to provide notification to those folks that are within that area. Um, that area will probably not change for this year once we've made that determination of what that area is. Um, did I answer your question? The towers. The tower. Um, the towers came up. Yes. So, and what are the tower? I don't even know what that refers to. So, I think the reference is to. Um, when we talk about the trunk of the tree, that's transmission. Um, those are high volume um, bulk movement of electricity through our system that might come all the way from Oregon down into California or come from Utah into California. Um, uh, when we start getting into the smaller branches of the tree, those are the ones that are running up through the high fire threat district um, up in the mountains that come over to this location. And so I think when he describes um, towers, and I heard mention of making our system strong enough, and we are going through that exercise of strengthening the system,
to handle different weather conditions. But I, I, I do believe the comment was made that um, that public safety power shutoff is is a measure that the company would only take at the very extreme end of the need to keep people safe. Um, it's not our first line of defense. It's our last line of defense. Um, so we, we just want to make sure that everyone understands that. Um, I think the towers reference is to um, what supports those lines um, coming into this area. And um, again, um, I, I heard a question around the reference of we have our language around tier two, tier three, high fire threat district, that kind of language. I would invite anyone who has interest in that. Um, CAL FIRE and the California Public Utilities Commission um, came together to approve a high fire threat district map. And you can go on to the CPUC website and you'll look up higher fi high fire threat district. There's a publicly available map there that shows you in very distinct red, orange, and no color um, gradients of what the high fire threat districts are throughout California and more specifically this area. So that's a publicly available document. That was not created by PG&E. That was created by CAL FIRE uh, and approved by the CPUC for all of us to have a common reference of what those high fire threat areas are. Would it be possible for you to supply a map to the city so that we can put it on our website as to what area uh, would be served by the sub, I'll call it a substation, but power station, um, as well as what area is not going to be. And I think that will answer some questions that folks said. Or, I mean, I've got a pretty good idea of where it is, but perhaps I have a little bit better understanding of how it works. I don't know. So if we could get that on our city website as to the zones that will have power and the zone that will not have power, I think that will uh, answer some questions. Uh, also, uh, the press is well represented in the room. Um, and perhaps that could also go to the newspaper and the newspaper could, uh, newspapers could have something um, that way. I, uh, we inevitably in this community have a section segment of the community that never gets the word until after the fact and um, that shouldn't surprise you but um, uh, I think we can make some efforts so that when someone says no one told me that and we can say well you know it was televised it was in the newspaper it was on the website you know um, that we have uh, as much information going out there on what is and isn't going to be included in this. And uh, uh, um, so I think we're able to share as much information um, <clears throat> without getting ahead of ourselves. We don't want to give people the impression that X area will be generated uh, and Y won't be uh, w without power um, until we know. I mean, there's, there, as John said, and, and the gentleman rightly said, a lot of eventuallys and hopefullys and maybes and studies, and, and <clears throat> we need to, to take a look at the site and, and configure it. Uh, pending the council's decision whether or not we need to take a look at the adjacent site or, or what are the boundaries. And so public information can be helpful. I think sharing conceptual, it's been confusing here this evening with uh, John you here. You can to, see the anxiety coming out. Well, know. so yeah, and I think uh, what I want to do is get to another question as well that was asked. And it was a good question. Uh, why is PG&E here offering generators? because we're not doing that in a lot of other places. And uh, I live in Napa. I'm the representative for the North Bay. And I was here um, you know, with Aaron Johnson from PG&E. There was a much larger community meeting um, <clears throat> that we had. Uh, and 
we recognized the impact. There was, there were almost back-to-back -back public safety power shutoffs. One, uh, we did not shut off the power in Calistoga. Uh, that was the second one that came, and, and we were able to, to avoid that situation. Um, where we did shut off the power the following day when we went up the lines, as we talked about as our process to inspect before we turned the power back on, we found multiple locations where the trees had fallen into the lines. High winds, very dry, very similar situations to 2017 with trees that had fallen in, into the lines. And so um, that's the real reason that we're here. Calistoga is a, is a situation where our lines run through areas that the Public Utilities Commission has designated as very high fire threat. And I, I was nodding my head earlier. You asked if it was possible to put a map on the website, and I thought you were asking about the map of the high fire threat zones, um, which, is an, which is a great map. And, I, and if it's possible, to, if, if it isn't already, I don't know. But I think it would be helpful. I think it is. <clears throat> I think it would be helpful to the community um, to, to, to see how small of a, of a sliver of, of the almost the boundaries of the city are before it goes straight into tier two and tier three areas that the entire community is surrounded and that's why we're here um, and we will work with the city we understand the community I w I've spent eight years in your seat on the Napa City Council and I understand the importance of trying to help people yeah, I, I, I get the impacts. I understand it. Um, the reason we're here is to try and keep as much of Calistoga powered during a very busy time of year. But, you know, business aside and, and tourism aside, uh, help provide power to residents, people who are retired. Maybe they're not working anymore. Um, where we can, uh, mobile home parks in that configuration. All will be, uh, you know, John and Mike and others can, can work on it. But the reason that we're here is to try and help the community because we have seen the impacts twice of the public safety power shutoff. We're virtually certain they're going to continue. I don't know if I roundaboutly answered your question. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I think you have. But besides the fire severity zones, uh, I would like to see if we can get a general boundary area that this facility will serve uh, during a power outage. So I think the answer to your, the answer to your question is eventually we can prov provide that boundary. I mean, John, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we will know as we start to dial it in and, and find out where we can isolate these points that don't go out into the tier two areas that are a threat. And, w and how much power there is and how far we can extend it determines the, the polygon or the area. And eventually, absolutely, that will be mapped out and that can be provided. What I want to be... not prepared to do it right now. Or you can't I would right be now. hesitant to do that. Um, sharing information... W w right yeah, I mean, it would, be, it would be sharing information of pure concept. That I think people might see it, as you mentioned already, maybe somebody sees it once and they don't follow the rest of the string and they come back later and they say, wait, I saw this map. My home is supposed to have power and it doesn't. That's what I'm getting to. We would hope we could have that information as soon as possible so people can plan, you know, if they're not going to have power oh, <clears throat> to yeah. their, you know, they can, there's time for them to plan accordingly. I agree. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Your community <clears throat> needs to be supported with what that area is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, we, once we've gotten to that point in other communities, we've been able to work with the community, yourselves included, and emergency operations, and to provide that area that would be energized. So there's, there's definitely definition to who will be supported and who needs to be prepared otherwise. Okay. And if I could just, um, <laughs> so I apologize for the tag team. He, it's okay. We're a tag yep. team too, and so are they. It's it's um, so John, you know, electric engineering, architecture, infrastructure. That's his, that's his specialty. I don't even try and touch it. Mine is is working with cities and city managers, and 
in some cases, first responders. And so, you know, we, we're preparing. There's, there's many paths that PG&E is, is moving forward on to prepare for the, uh, for the um, wildfire season, though we're in it, but the critical stages. And so um, we have uh, a process. We're, we're actually using it now here in Calistoga where we contact dis police dispatch. We talk to the uh, interim city manager. We talk with the mayor. We, we communicate, uh, and I work with our media folks, trying to push messaging out. Um, in advance, assuming that, that this particular um, area is up and running, and we know where those areas are, as soon as we are firm on that information, we would push that out and get that information. We'll work with our customer teams to send out automated messages to people who are outside of the energized zone, who can expect to be de-energized, and um, help coordinate and communicate with the city places that people should expect to have power and where they should expect not to have power. So that's, that's what we could do for the messaging. We're working closely with folks here locally. We're working with the County Office of Emergency Services. This could be an event that could, could be that goes from Calistoga to St. Helena, parts of the city of Napa may be de-energized. You already mentioned that we're pre preparing for possibly larger cities being impacted. Um, so I just want to, the communication, we're going to try and keep it as fluid and, and tight as we can. Yes, shifting gears just a bit, can we allay the concern of the community garden uh, folks about um, access to the garden if, if the proposed area is used or the one next to it? Do you anticipate that the garden, uh, there would be a, a restriction to access, restriction to the garden in that way? No, I, um, I think it's a beautiful garden. I believe the access is off from the ballpark parking area um, on, on that uh, eastern side. I don't perceive any issues with that. Our, our connection point would come out to uh, Washington and down Washington. Um, so I don't perceive any, any um, access issues. I also heard water and electrical to that area. I don't foresee any um, issues with the water and as far as electrical go it might be one of the one of the places within the boundary for uh, where it's at uh, I don't know where the electric line um, connects to that area but it will be supported as well through the through the system most likely thank you <laughs> mm -hmm. okay Iris, any other questions or comments? Um, anybody want to summarize uh, some direction for staff? Um, there is a resolution. <clears throat> I, you want to I summarize your position? I a couple things I, I mm -hmm. wanted to say. Uh, when we <clears throat> approved the study for the microgrid, there was two reasons. First reason was is because we wanted to make sure that we had power in town um, uh, when the public safety power shutoffs occur. That was one reason. The other reason we uh, uh, did that was because we want to get to zero emissions. Uh, and that was a component of that uh, study. And uh, I think it's just as important as, uh, in the long run, as, as making sure that a significant part of the town uh, stays powered up. I think from a public safety standpoint, uh, to have the power off in town for three days uh, or longer uh, presents a lot of problems. Uh, the problems can range from people lighting their home with candles, people running their own generators uh, in their garage, and possible carbon monoxide or refueling accident. Um, we have an elevator in town that serves the second and third floor of a senior citizen center that doesn't work when the power goes off um, schools close when the power goes off uh, what are we going to do with 600 kids that need something to do for the next three days and they can't run their nintendo so um uh you know when you really start looking at a long-term power outage um, computers go down, um, there's just all kinds of things 
that are negative um, that occur. So I, I really think it's a public, sa it's public safety interest that we have as much of the town powered as much as, as, much as we can. So um, uh, I, I wanted to let everybody know that I'm, I, while I'm sensitive to uh, noise, I'm sensitive to the potential for pollution uh, that comes out of this, I'm also sensitive uh, to what happens in town when the power goes off for, for three days and then comes back on for maybe two or three days and then goes right back <coughs> off again. So um, uh, this may not be a perfect solution, but I think it, uh, and I think it needs some work and I think pg and is willing to work on it a little bit. I, I also wanted to add that the city has an economic interest. When the power goes off for two or three days, we, we have to protect our industry. We have the wine industry, we have the tourism industry, we have guests staying in hotel rooms, which are paying transient occupancy, transient occupancy tax to the city. The power goes out, they go home. And in addition to that, we get bad press on the news saying that Calistoga is blacked out for three or four days and people start canceling the reservations. And that has a direct financial impact to the city. So we're talking, the proposal that pg and &E has sent us talks about a backup to the backup, right, at north end of Lincoln and the trail. And so that, so I'm okay with that going in. I mean, that, that's projected. They want permission to put that in uh, if needed. And, and I'm fine with that. I don't really want to throw the dog park under the bus. Um, and so, so I'm concerned about, um, I'm concerned about that. And the location that, that the council has assigned to them uh, works out for a lot of people and the garden as well. What about, um, you know, what about looking into using that area, the boneyard area right next to it, using that and redistributing the boneyard, or supposing the boneyard gets put into the dog park in the short term with the understanding that it gets redistributed maybe to the fairgrounds or elsewhere uh, as time passes. The, the dog park isn't up and running at the moment. I just think the amount of effort it's going to take to clean up that boneyard is significant. We, we have the area designated as dog park, which it's been there for three years. Nothing's really happened. It's, it's an easy solution. It's in the right location. It's the furthest away from impacting residents in the downtown. And let's prioritize on finding a relocation for the dog park. I mean, I want to have the best dog park. So let's make that happen. I mean, we, we have money. We have funds. Let's uh, look at the fairgrounds and let's make it happen. I mean, we, we can't not do this. It's, it's, in, it's in the best interest of the city. It's a public safety issue. Um, I will say that we need to be prepared. And I know the solution, it might not be uh, what everybody will like, but uh, we will have so many issues, so many problems if we are without power. Um, we uh, have it on the past, and we all got affected. Uh, but when that happens, so we need to, as I say, we need to be preparing. And, you know, we have to do uh, this. So what about the idea of, uh, am I correct that the, the area, the triangle at Lincoln and the trail is part of the proposal and, and that would be an option, uh, you know, a backup option, regardless of whether this goes in dog park area so what our conversations with PG&E have been is ideally that they, they do this once and and the effort is expended and it's you know bears good fruit if there are and that's why we, we recommended the dog park or something in that general vicinity if there are issues that preclude that from happening because again I, I can't overemphasize you know the time constraints that we're potentially under if within the next 45 days or so that we find some fatal gotchas 
then they're going to have to re-mobilize and move smartly to affect the the triangular piece at, at Lincoln and the trail. And I, I I just can't overemphasize that. I mean, they need planning time. They need they need to mobilize. You know, their their crews. I think going back to the tower discussion, I almost want to say that that is talking about what is the what is the distribution line that needs to be extended to this location? So yes, there will be new power poles installed along Lower Washington that will ultimately tie into the existing power grid that's right across or right in front of Crystal Geyser. There's nothing between Crystal Geyser and this location, so new new infrastructure needs to be constructed, built. And then they have to basically rewire or replumb the electric distribution system from this point all the way to the intersection of Fairway and North Oak. So that's the extent of the work that they're, they're contemplating doing to make sure that, that the area that this system can, can power is able to meet the demands and the needs of that portion of the community that is within what I'll call the safe zone. And, and this is not something that, I mean, there's probably, I'm going to guess, there's like a 30 to 45 day window of time that it's go or no go for for this for this location and, and if it's a no go then it's a 30 day we've got to go like crazy to get the the trail and and Lincoln site ready to go <clears throat> yeah i mean don i don't mm -hmm. in my opinion we cannot have generators at that location i mean it's a gateway I to know. our community we we have a plan that we're we're it's almost shovel ready to the tra tra the trailhead uh, plan with the parking and the landscaping and uh, uh, that the, the shade structures and picnic tables. I mean that's there's a plan that's ready getting close to it could be the being, new dog park. Well, you know, well I was thinking just, the same thing. There may be an opportunity to you know <laughs> carve out some corners over there. Um, well, I mean I don't know. We can we can revisit that, but timing is of the essence. We we got to go full throttle on this thing and and have staff work out the details and get this ready by you know end of August or whenever. And you know moving things around at the boneyard that's just going to consume time. We've got a vacant plot of land there, land there, and let's just. So if this it. if this resolution passes, then um, then that gives permission for pg e to use that area at the north end of the trail or or they will they will put generators there uh, regardless so i guess this is an either or so the either is or the or is we want to put it at the dog park area that's that's the prime location mm -hmm. and if we're able to we i'm in you know bringing pg e into this if they're able to get this work done and you know all the engineering done then that's where they were they're focusing their efforts and and that was primarily because in our opinion it's the area that's going to generate the least amount of impacts to the community at large if something goes sideways and that is not doable then the next location that that they believe they can get ready to do is the, the triangular piece and and the reason that location is attractive to them is one it's it's an open field there's there's nothing there and it's a very short distance for them to extend their conductors basically across the street so they don't have to spend a, a ton of effort and money running new lines and power poles but you've got <clears throat> you've got businesses you've got residents you've got it, uh church it church. wasn't yeah. it wasn't attractive I, for all of me, those it's reasons non, it's a non-option it was the it was the easier plug and play yeah. that had the greatest amount of impact to the community yeah so I'm also hearing maybe just a point of clarity the site at the I think is being remarked as the five-way the triangle the triangle mm -hmm. um, that would strictly be a temporary use while we build permanent infrastructure somewhere if this were to have delays or not be usable and we had to find a different location that location on the on the triangle is strictly a temporary location that we could stand up very quickly like like in a matter of days if we knew an event was coming 
we could stand that up very quickly, run a wire across the road and connect into our circuit with no circuit work to be done. So it's virtually, virtually a last minute um, emergency condition that we could, we could use a piece of land that would make that work. We looked at a couple of other <coughs> locations and, and it, it required us to do more work than we could do on a very, very short notice matter of days. So if this, if this project were to be delayed, um, for whatever reasons, either you haven't got the labor to do it, because right now there's a real problem. It's an issue, uh, yep. uh, With getting people to do stuff. Um, so that could go in, as you say, very, very quickly and stand and be a standby while this is being completed if necessary correct that was the intent we we backed into a date of roughly september and we said hey what do we have to do to meet that september time frame and we said okay well that means we need to have this conversation get the land build the infrastructure do the reconductoring all of those projects meeting that september time frame for this year if something happens in between there, PSPS is called in between there, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna support you? So we said, let's, let's make a contingency plan to make sure that we can support the population during that time. So we identified that spot as a temporary stand-up location. Once the event's done, we remove the equipment. That land is completely available for any other purpose. There's no permanent infrastructure that goes in in that location. Got it. it it's all temporary nature. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Somebody want to make a motion? Sure. Thank you, Richard. Again, I see the way the vote's going. I'm not unhappy with that. Uh, but let's say that they put this in and everything west of the river does not get power. They don't know who's going to get power. What happens then? Where is, who's going to oversee this? Who's going to say that's not acceptable? You need to power that section, this section, and this section. It's nice to have all of the resorts and things like that have power. They draw megawatts okay for all their hot tubs and swimming pools and things of this sort but they don't have a plan so the thing well, is mm -hmm. somewhere give us a plan or give you a plan so the citizens can take a look at it. the other question was and I think you answered it Michael is that yes there's going to be infrastructure in my reference to a tower is that there's going to have poles they're going to have something still standing there when they pull out all of the generators and I'm not too sure they're going to pull the, all the generators out. It just costs a fortune for low beds and things like that. Those things are going to sit there until they rust into the ground. But, uh, you know, there is all of that uh, infrastructure going by the, uh, the storage facility, going by the water company, going by all that, what is it? They haven't told you what it is. Uh, yeah, Thank I think you. this is going to be a, a process going forward, and we've heard all the comments, okay. and I think um, both the council and staff have heard, heard you, and we're going to negotiate all these details. Can I add sure, if you could make it quick. Thanks. I do understand tears. When the power was off, I did explain to many friends they have to bring it on in sections, otherwise it's, it's too much for the system. So I do understand your tears. Uh, <clears throat> looking at, on my, on my pad, looking at the current section down there, the boneyard isn't nearly as junky as it is in that picture. I look it up on your smartphones. I, you can easily do it on maps. I did it on mine. There is still the option of keeping this, the, the park. To say that he hasn't done anything out there is a real disservice to Scott. I have seen him out there working hard trying to clean that place up. So it's like him doing all this work to clean it up and somebody coming along and going, no offense, but it's like, oh, this is nice. It's really a disservice to the community, to the dog owners, and to Scott. Well, I, I certainly appreciate And I, I do I, see, if you look at your yeah. maps, I think there's a better option available that would be more 
be nicer, more polite, more friendly to the community garden, to Little League, and to the dog park. I really do. I think there's a win-win here. It's going to take a lot of work by Public Works to clean up some of their area or move some stuff. But I think there's a better... This is a gateway as well. If we can make that work, we'll do it. This is a gateway as well. You have your vine trail right there. Little League was approached on the vine trail. The reason the president is not here is she is on a school field trip. So I think there's a win-win. It's going to take a lot of work by Public Works. But you shouldn't take the dog park from those that have worked hard for it. Scotty being one of them. And I told him jokingly that when the dog park was going down there, I wanted higher fields or higher fences on Tedeschi to keep the dogs off because everybody looks at it and goes, oh, this is nicer than what they need the green grass. They love the green grass. So I think there's a win-win here. It's going to take work by a lot more people. It's going to be harder. But if this is going to be more permanent than what it's sounding like, it's a better solution to dig a little deeper, move a little further. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion? Sure, I'll make a motion that we see how uh, uh, we adopt the resolution. Is there a second? I second that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, no. There's one no. We will take into consideration all of the comments and work closely with pg and &E to try and minimize or negate any impacts to the dog park property. I've got some ideas. Preserve the garden. Preserve the restrooms. <laughs> Throw Public Works <laughs> Boneyard under the bus, yeah. and, and we'll, we'll, if, we'll try if, and figure something out. If we can out. save a, a, do, a, temp, a dog park, save it as best we yeah. can. Okay. So we've, I've got some ideas, and I think you know we, we have a good, good go-forward direction. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we're going to move on to item number 10. Gentlemen, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you for coming. Uh, item number 10 is the option to purchase affordable housing unit at 1809 Aurora Drive. And I know uh, Council Member Krause has a conflict here. Uh, do you want to state your conflict? Yes, I live about 200 feet from the property, so I'm excluded from uh, the conversation and voting on this issue. So I'll step out. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if everybody could step outside, please, uh, just so we can finish up the meeting. Thank you. Director Goldberg. Hello. Thank, thank you for waiting for all this time. <laughs> Mike owes me on this one. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> he offered to take this item. I'm like, oh, no, I'll, you know, I'll take it. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, the property in question, 1809 Aurora, was one of the three original affordable units in the uh, Emerald Oak subdivision that was deed restricted um, and sold to a moderate income household back in the 90s. Um, at that time, the developer also provided a promissory note to the city in the amount of $24,000 to make the unit affordable. And so there's a deed restriction on the property that if it ever sells that the city has first option. and try to make it uh, to retain its affordability um, the initial owner uh, after 23 years has expressed an interest in selling the house uh, an, uh, estimated for fair market value of the house that was uh, prepared for us by the housing authority is now seven hundred and twenty nine thousand dollars and so that gap um, has now increased to approximately three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars in down payment assistance that would be needed to keep this house in um, eligible for um, and affordable to an afford uh, lower or moderate income household. So um, on that basis, the city has allowed the other two restricted Emerald Oaks properties to be sold at market rate prices. We do collect the uh, initial principal and then 10 years of interest, which in this case would equal $36,000 which would be deposited in the city's affordable housing fund and used to support um, other affordable housing interests. So um, we uh, are recommending that uh, the city not exercise its option to purchase the pri uh, property in light of the uh, very large gap that would be needed in terms of a long-term subsidy uh, for the next household. 
and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any no. questions? No questions. Uh, just, the old, just for clarification, if this house, uh, if we don't acquire this house and it gets sold to a private um, buyer, this house cannot be any more affordable house. That's right. It would be sold to anyone at a fair market price, which is estimated at $729,000. Unfortunately, it's no longer $24,000. <laughs> if it were still $24,000 to make it affordable, I think we would be having a different discussion. But uh, since that would be pretty much all of our affordable housing fund, and uh, we wouldn't have any surety of when we get that money back, um, it's probably not the best use of our housing fund. Okay. So what we've done in the past is we've been trying to get these off the books because we can, uh, we'll make a little money from it, um, and then as opposed to putting in 300000 on a single family house, we can do something like buy property, you know, exactly. for four or five, you know, three, four hundred thousand, like we did behind the Calistoga Spa, we bought those two lots. And then we can partner with uh, a housing developer and get more density and more units and more bang for the buck. In exchange for losing one home, Yeah. unfortunately. Okay, um, so I think you have, um, I support the action of uh, not exercising the city's option to purchase, and I think uh, Council Member Williams is the same. I, yeah. Yes, I, I agree, and I uh, move that we adopt the resolution as. Um, I don't think there's a resolution. There's not a resolution. Oh, I just, just need a motion to not option, uh, exercise the option. Just a, you need a motion on that? Yes. Okay, sir. then I'll move that you exer that we exercise the option that you recommend. Not, yeah. Not okay. exercise. Not the exercise the option. Oh, oh, our option me. to purchase. Yeah, yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> that we not purchase. Right. And that, that, that alternative. Yes. yes. Okay, you. that's what I mean. And I said second that. that. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. All right, so that uh, brings us to adjournment. Um, our next regular scheduled meeting is Tuesday, June 4th at 6 o'clock. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Mike.